It's a missing trend in society today, and I'm talking about trustworthy truth. Broadcast media, the internet, filled with opinions, speculation, and the perspectives of people on just about everything under the sun. But thankfully, we as Christians are not left to sink in the sea of speculation. We have a totally trustworthy source for accurate, intelligent information and instruction. It is the Bible, because the Bible is the divinely inspired, infallible Word of the living God. The Bible does not contain the Word of God. The Bible is the Word of God. Within the Bible is everything we need to know for what we are to believe and also how we are to behave. And the Bible is the final authority for every Christian in all matters of faith and practice. Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. Hear the word of the Lord. But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I may also be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. Now encapsulated in these two verses are some tremendous truths which are transparently communicated by the Apostle Paul as he graciously gives us a glimpse into his heart concerns. During his missionary journeys, Paul had seen God at work in mighty ways as people came to saving faith in Christ and New churches were planted in the various locations that he visited. Amazingly, he remembered their names. He prayed consistently with caring concern for their spiritual welfare. As I read these words, I have to ask myself, what would I be thinking? How would I be feeling if I were imprisoned and shackled as Paul was when he wrote this epistle? Writing from prison, Paul expresses the deepest desires of his heart to be updated with the news of how things were with the believers back in Philippi. Now think about this for a moment. He wasn't sending Timothy to them to tell them about all his own problems and difficulties in the prison. He was planning to send Timothy to visit with them and report back with news of their present condition and their progress. We know there was absolutely no sense in which he viewed this negatively because he clearly states in the text of Scripture he fully expected to be encouraged when he learned of their condition. His focus was not on himself, but it was firmly fixed on others. Paul trusted Timothy. And those three words, Paul trusted Timothy, are very interesting because it said that a person is fortunate if they have even five good, trustworthy friends during their lifetime. Despite the fact that today there are 335 million people in the United States, George Barner, in his book What Americans Believe, wrote, Americans are among the loneliest people on earth. It's a recognized reality. You can be in a large crowd but still be very lonely. A true friend can encourage, can affirm, and even, if he's a true friend, even rebuke. You can trust a friend with your secrets. You can trust a friend with your valuables. Now today, it's not at all unusual for a person to have a very large number of social media contacts, some acquaintances and several casual connections. But the simple truth is, good friends are really hard to find. Philippians 2, 19. But I hope in the Lord Jesus 
to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I may also be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. Paul had a, a very deep affection for Timothy, his son-in-law in the faith. He trusted Timothy with complete confidence that Timothy would faithfully represent him when he went to Philippi and then come back with the news of their condition and their spiritual progress. Remember that at this time Paul was confined in chains, in prison. He was unable to travel himself. But he was living out in practice what he commanded in the fourth verse of this same chapter. What was that? Philippians chapter 2 verse 4. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. The Apostle Paul was the real deal. He didn't merely talk the talk, he walked the walk. He was an example of true godly living for the people around him in the prison and for all those whose spiritual welfare were his daily prayerful concerns. His concern for others was not something he assumed, it was completely genuine from his heart. There's a reason for that. We human beings are created by God for community and fellowship. And the simple truth is that we function much better when we are flanked by faithful friends. Unlike many of us today, Paul didn't need name tags to determine who people were. He knew their names, and people knew him. He was a true friend to many. The Bible has evidence of this clearly seen in the 16th chapter of Romans. And in that chapter, he lists no less than 35 of his friends by name. In many of his letters, he mentions individuals by name. These were men with whom he'd built excellent relationships during his ministry. Check it out for yourself. You'll find that he closes nearly every one of his epistles or letters with a personal note to some of these very special people. And to be very honest with you and transparent, I find this personally quite challenging. Paul has written of two examples of self-sacrificing love. The first, of course, was the Lord Jesus Christ. But the second was Paul himself in his own testimony. Both the Savior and Paul were willing to pour out their lives unto death. And even as we continue to work our way through this chapter, we're going to see two more wonderful examples of this same self-sacrificing love. Timothy and Epaphroditus. Paul is writing to the saints in Philippi to prepare the way for the expected visit of Timothy in the near future, and then later on Epaphroditus. Paul's letter was informing them of this so that when they arrived, they would be accepted as his representatives and also with his authority. Who was Epaphroditus? He was a leader in the church at Philippi who had traveled to visit Paul and brought a financial gift to Paul from the church and whom Paul sent back with this letter. Philippians 2.25 I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier who is also your messenger and minister to my need. It's truly a sad commentary on the self-centered spiritual condition of the believers of that time that Paul had to write about them in verse 21. They all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. Now, it's truly astonishing that of all the people he knew, Timothy was the only one that Paul could name who had the interest of Christ at heart. The predominant emphasis of this chapter is others, specifically of becoming a servant, and the major exhortation is to have the same attitudes in ourselves that was in Christ Jesus. Listen carefully. The life of the risen Christ in the believer 
will never be expressed in any way that is contrary to his divine nature. Let me bring this right down to everyday living. I was asked one day if a Christian should ever lie. Would there ever be a circumstance in which he should lie? Now you've heard me say many times that we must develop the habit of thinking biblically at all times. So immediately my thought process was, what does the Bible teach about this? And my mind went to John chapter 14 verse 6, a scripture verse you know very well. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus Christ is truth. So let me repeat what I said just a moment ago. The life of the risen Christ in me, the believer, will never be expressed in a way that is contrary to his divine nature. That means Christ in me will never lie. Now that may be an uncomfortable truth in many circumstances, but it's absolutely true. John chapter 8 verse 44 states very clearly that it is Satan who is a liar and the father of lies. So you are either of God or you are either of Satan. If you truly are of God, you cannot lie. If Christ truly is my life, as we read in chapter 1, then Christ must be my attitude. Philippians 2, 19 to 20. But I hope in the Lord Jesus, to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I may also be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. The Apostle Paul was obviously an excellent communicator in his written communications and in his strategy of sending special messengers to speak in person and then report back concerning the spiritual welfare of those to whom they'd been sent. And as we read those first three words in verse 19, but I hope, we need to understand very clearly that his use of the word hope doesn't imply any sense of doubt whatsoever. It's an expression of confident expectation that this is something that really will take place. It's not merely wishful thinking. There's something else here that we might miss if we move too quickly through the text. As much as Paul valued Timothy, his hope was not in Timothy, but clearly stated to be in the Lord. The present tense indicates this is Paul's continual desire. It's not just a glib cliche. This is the way Paul lived, as other expressions in his letters make very clear. 1 Corinthians 4.19, I will come to you soon if the Lord wills. 1 Corinthians 16.7, I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. In the church I attended when I was growing up, there was a deacon who frequently led in prayer and made announcements. And I remember him very distinctly because he would always conclude his prayer by saying, all of this is Deo Volante. God willing. Paul says, in effect, my hope is not an idle one, but it's founded on faith in the Lord. And this phrase emphasizes that Paul's every thought, word, and deed proceeded from the Lord as the center of his volition. This inevitably forces me to ask myself the question, could this same be said about me? Isaiah eleven twelve. Isaiah says there shall come the root of Jesse, and in him who arises to rule over the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. Matthew, New Testament, 12, 21. And in his name the Gentiles will hope. In his first epistle to Timothy, we read about the ultimate source of hope. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus, who is our hope. And this phrase, in the Lord, tells us that Paul's every thought, every word, and every deed 
proceeded from the Lord as the center of his volition and motivation. Paul is saying, in effect, my hope is not an idle one, but one that is founded on faith in the Lord. And since all believers, true believers that is, are in Christ, this vital union we have with the Savior should influence every thought and every activity in which we engage. Dwight Edwards writes that though Paul couldn't be there himself, he did feel responsible for their spiritual welfare. So first he writes them this letter. Now he tells of his expectation to send Timothy to them. Hope, more than a wishful hope, it is a confident expectation. Not grounded in Timothy, but in the Lord Jesus. The same Lord who commissioned Paul would also send Paul's son in the faith. There was a definite sense of urgency Paul was feeling toward these believers. He didn't just leave their spiritual maturity up to God. He felt a keen responsibility for them. And Timothy was an able ambassador. He's ready to go anywhere to help anyone and to pay any price. During my teenage years, I attended a series of special meetings with Bible ministry from a very well-known expositor of Holy Scripture. He was wonderfully gifted by God and opened up the Scriptures every evening, expounding the truth contained within the particular passage that was the focus of his attention. On the final evening of his ministry, he dealt with the subject of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And I was enthralled until... As he neared the end, he began to focus on the absolute necessity of fully surrendering to the sovereign lordship of Jesus Christ in every area of life. He brought a solemn challenge to us to review our lives and see if that was true of us. If we had ever, at a particular moment in time, laid everything at the feet of Jesus so that we would be willing to go anywhere he commanded us to go, to do anything he commanded us to do, whatever the personal price or cost may be, including the possibility of death. And then he called for a response. It was a turning point in my life. I would either surrender fully to the sovereign lordship of Jesus Christ in every area of my life, or I would have to reject the one who had actually given his life for me. I sat uncomfortably in the meeting, struggling. But then it dawned on me, I really didn't have any choice in the matter. I yielded in full and glad surrender to the sovereign lordship of Jesus Christ in every area of my life. I told him I was willing to go anywhere, at any time and at any cost, that his sovereign lordship would require. I have to tell you that the peace that flooded my soul at that moment is absolutely indescribable. And decades later, I can testify that nothing compares to the excellency of knowing Christ Jesus, my sovereign Lord, and the priceless privilege of serving him. Timothy was a man who was fully surrendered to the lordship of Jesus Christ. He was originally from Lystra, a place we know today as T Turkey. He grew up in a multicultural house. He had a Greek father. He had a Jewish Christian mother and grandmother. His name, interestingly, means one who honors God. But he wasn't circumcised, as was the Jewish custom. But this exposure to both the Greek and the Jewish traditions served him well as he helped Paul spread the gospel to the Gentiles. Paul had led Timothy to faith in Christ at a young age, and Timothy was instrumentally involved in Paul's ministry from very early on. Timothy was with Paul in Corinth. He was sent into Macedonia. He was with Paul on his return to, trip to Jerusalem. He assisted Paul, listen, in the writing of Romans, 2 Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, and Philemon. In fact, it's been said that Timothy was Paul's sole authorized representative of the gospel. For years, Paul had relied on Timothy. He trusted him completely. 
F. B. Meyer said, quote, I have only one ambition, to be God's errand boy, close quote. Lord, send me forth, O oh, send me forth, I pray. The need is great, thy call I will obey. Thy love compels me, I must go. I'm longing, ready, willing to go. Philippians 2, 19 and 20. But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. There's no question at all about the fact that Paul was an outstanding man of God. He wasn't merely what we might today call a, quotes, holy Joe. In every human sense, he was just like you and me. But there's a wonderful, quite wonderful transparency in his testimony as he states his purpose for sending Timothy to the church in Philippi that I may also be encouraged. Isn't it interesting to discover that even a great man of God like the Apostle Paul needed encouragement? <laughs> encouragement is a common human need. Those who give encouragement to others are a tremendous blessing. I was five years old when I began to have piano lessons. And it very quickly became obvious God had been pleased to bless me with a gift in music. My mother was an excellent pianist and understood the importance of regular practice every day. Even when my, my friends were out playing, I was confined to the front room of the house where the piano was located, playing scales and ar arpeggio exercises. I opened the hymn book on the piano one day after doing that, and started to try and play one of the hymns in the book. I'd never done that before. My mother came into the room with a surprised look on her face and said, John, if you keep practicing, you'll soon be able to play for the hymns in church. That simple expression of encouragement great, gave me tremendous incentive to practice even harder and eventually also learn to play the large pipe organ in the local Baptist tabernacle. Even if you have nothing else to give, you can always give encouragement. There's a little poem by K.D. Hahn. It says, it may seem insignificant to say a word or two, but when it's encouragement, what wonders it can do. Philippians 2, 19 and 20. But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly so that I may also be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. Now in the original Greek, the phrase no one else is actually much stronger. It's absolutely not one or not even one. Isn't this truly astonishing? Here we have the man who was probably the world's greatest preacher, teacher, evangelist, church planter, author of much of the New Testament, expressing sadly that he has no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for the welfare of the saints in Philippi. And this same Sense of disappointment comes through in several of Paul's statements to Timothy shortly before he died. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, You are aware, he writes, of the fact that all who were in Asia turned away from me, among whom were Phygelus and Hermogenes. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. 2 Timothy 4.16, at my first defense, he was on trial. No one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. Discouragement is a problem for many Christians. While they may not be distressed necessarily about their health, family, or work. Some are discouraged about their spiritual service. They, they spend time, and it is spent, it's not invested, 
They spend time comparing themselves with others who are gifted in some particular way. And they see people who are able to give generously or pray with evident effectiveness. And they think to themselves, I can't do any of these things. I'm useless to God. They need to realize that every Christian is gifted spiritually and qualified to carry out at least one helpful ministry. What is that ministry? The ministry of encouragement. See, it's not what's on the label, it's what is inside that really matters. We can lead in name only by our title, or we can lead by character and responsibility. You may be thinking, well, John, that's all right in theory. But what about a situation where there is no encouragement? Things look really bleak. Think biblically at all times. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6. David was greatly distressed because the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved every man for his sons and daughters. But... Three letters. What a difference. David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. The great preacher Spurgeon writes, Paul himself had this natural care, but he couldn't think of anyone else of like mind to himself except Timothy. The man of God who feels the force of holy fatherhood will do anything and everything possible and even impossible for the sake of his spiritual children. He gladly gives of himself for them, even though the more he loves, the less he may be loved. By the force of inward prompting, he is compelled to self-denying labor on their behalf. That little phrase that Paul used, kindred spirit, it was used in secular Greek to convey the idea of having much in common with one another, or sharing the same feelings. Paul is saying, in essence, that only Timothy could be trusted by Paul to demonstrate the level of care that he would have given had he been able to go personally to Philippi. It's somewhat reminiscent of the Old Testament friendship between Saul's son, Jonathan, and David. 1 Samuel 18.1, it came about when he had finished speaking to Saul, Jonathan committed himself to David, and listen, Jonathan loved him as himself. 1 Samuel 18.3, Jonathan made a covenant with David. Why? Because he loved him as himself. We all have numerous acquaintances, and perhaps even a few close friends in our life, but Finding a friend like Timothy and Aphroditus were to Paul or Jonathan was to David a truly wonderful discovery. The experience of being with someone who has the same one of oneness of spirit is a very special blessing. These people stand out as rare gems in a world that's filled with people who are almost completely self-centered, only concerned with their own wealth, health, and welfare. Now, the fact that Paul and Timothy had this special relationship doesn't mean that they always agreed. But it does mean being alongside each other and serving together was a true delight. Neither of them had to work hard to make that relationship work. Things just seem to flow seamlessly and smoothly between them. And one of the striking things that bound them together in the fellowship of the Spirit and the ministry was that both of them had a genuine concern for the welfare of others and they were working it out in everyday life. Today we would say they're working out what God worked in them resulted in the true blessing of others. See, you can have all the education and knowledge in the world, but unless you're living it out every day, it's meaningless. 
1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. If I speak with the tongues of mankind and of angels, but do not have love, I become a noisy gong or a clamming, clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. And if I give away all my possessions to charity, and if I surrender my body so I may glory, but do not have love, it does me no good. It's clearly obvious to everyone that the world in which we live today is in great trouble, and there's a reason for that. The world is under the curse of sin. When man rebelled against God in the Garden of Eden, he became broken. He desperately needs to be put back together again. And however hard he may try, he cannot possibly fix himself. That's precisely why the God who created us and loves us despite our rotten sinfulness cares deeply about our situation. And he's taken the steps necessary to restore us to wholeness. He came into the world in the person of Jesus Christ. He lived the perfect life. He healed the sick and raised the dead. He proclaimed the day of the Lord and fashioned the church as his body so that all the members should care for one another. 1 Corinthians 12, 25, that there be no division in the body, but that the parts may have the same care for one another. Well, that's all very well in theory, John, but... How can it possibly be worked out in everyday life? Great question. The answer is both simple and at the same time profound. So what do I mean by that? Simply that it's completely impossible for me to see it worked, in every, in, worked out in everyday life unless I'm totally surrendered to the sovereign lordship of Jesus Christ in every area of my life. And it's only the life of the risen Christ expressed through this mortal body that will have any lasting value. What that means is, it's time we need to stop trying to work it all out for ourselves. And only then can the words of Galatians 2.20 become real and evident to everyone. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Where are we going with this? Simply, it's time for change. It's time to stop prevaricating, procrastinating, and pretending. It's time right now to bow the knee and echo the words of the great hymn that was written by Francis Ridley Havergal. O Son of God, who loves me, I will be thine alone, and all I have and am, Lord, it shall be thine alone. In full and glad surrender, I give myself to thee, thine utterly, and only and evermore to be.